Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. So those of you who've been watching me for a while may know a little bit about my background as an attorney, but if you're new to my channel, then welcome. Please subscribe and click the notifications for more videos on my life, balancing my full-time career as an attorney with my interest in aesthetics and style, which is most of what I share on this channel. But here and there, I really enjoy discussing tips for professional workwear, for tips for success on starting your own business since I'm a business owner myself. And in this new series, since I passed the bar, more on that in a moment, I wanted to give back some of the knowledge that I've acquired over the last two years of that journey. I'm not a new attorney because I was qualified in Canada in 2013, but I am new to the US as a lawyer. I was born a US citizen, spent most of my life in Canada, then England for law school, back to Canada for my master's and to start my career. This is the first part of a three-part series where I first discussed the beginning end and every step in between of taking the bar as a foreign qualified attorney. The second part will be my tips for success for studying for the bar or in terms of productivity and mental state and what worked for me. And then the third and final part of this series will be more product based. So I'll be doing a review of the Barbary course that I took and a few other products that I used as well that I found sometimes helpful, sometimes not so helpful. Most bar prep programs programs cost upwards of $1,000 and since the average student spends somewhere between 300 to 600 hours preparing to sit for the bar, this feels like the right moment to share what I've learned along the way because I'm now, you know, a few months past actually sitting the bar and getting my results. So July 2021 results in September of 2021. And I know a lot of people are going to be sitting in my shoes with the February bar coming up and then the July bar gearing up. Foreign qualified attorneys do tend to study for longer. So you're probably already studying for the bar if you're preparing for the July session, if you are foreign qualified. This series is for you, but it's also for anyone who's interested in studying law, who is interested in hearing my study tips and my experience with the whole process as a little bit of an outsider. It's kind of my way of sharing the process with my community when I haven't done that yet. Since I didn't really share much of the process online with my community while it was happening, I wanted to kind of keep that headspace and just take a little bit of time to myself um, for it as well. Since I was working full time at the same time, I did take a little bit of a break from my internet life at the time. And so now I'm coming back with with everything that I learned along the way. I thought the time was perfect, not only because of what other people are going through um, right now with studying for the bar, thinking of taking the bar, also because I came back to town after some time away during the holidays and received my bar card in the mail. So here that is from Washington with a big piece of tape on it. It's actually really pretty because it has a view of Washington on the other side. At the same time, I got my bill from the Law Society of British Columbia. I've been receiving these for almost a decade now. So here's my bar card from the Law Society of BC. And then I also have something to frame, which is my certificate for passing the bar in Washington state. So here that is after I pass the bar. And keep in mind, passing the bar and being admitted to your chosen state of practice are actually separate steps. Because I feel like whenever you Google taking the bar and exam in the US, it throws you straight into this whirlpool of MBE, MEE, MPT, all of these terms that relate specifically to the exam experience. But very few resources actually provide you with much detail on the process from start to finish. I think the assumption is that if you went to a law school in the US, completed a JD, you already know all of these things. So this particular video is aimed a little bit at people who come from a different scenario. You may be a foreign qualified attorney like me coming from Canada and already admitted to a common law bar with several years of practice, or you might be coming in as well as an LLM student, so potentially a foreign attorney or foreign law student who's completed an LLM and seeking admittance to a US state with that LLM in hand. That's another option that is not as frequently discussed as ABA 
JD law graduates taking the bar. One of the big drivers for me to be admitted in Washington State for wanting to undergo all of that stress, I really wanted to be a part of an entrepreneurial environment and do work to help startups develop their businesses. That's a thirst that I grew over time. While I was working in Canada, I set up my own online e-commerce business and my own designs of jewelry as well. So my site is called L Florence. If you're interested in that, I am running a Valentine's Day sale right now where you get a free pair of classic white luxury freshwater pearl studs for free if you buy a cashmere scarf. Just these ones. Um, so this is the rainbow collection and I have got the ruby and the jade right here behind me. So that's my little plug. It's also me telling you a little bit about why I came here, why I wanted to do this. And it's important to have that motivation because let me tell you, this is a long process. Significant financial investment as well as many hundreds of hours of studying. So you have to have some kind of motivation to do that, a dream that you're seeking out, not just something to add to your resume for this to make sense. I'll talk more about motivation in the second video that I make in this series, but I do want to preface everything that I'm going to say with that. I was highly motivated to be a part of the firm that I'm at now. I was highly motivated to do work helping startups, to do cross-border business work, leveraging the experience that I had gained in Canada. And so I had a clear vision of where I wanted to be after taking the bar. And I'm now sitting in that chair, in that life right now, and I'm so happy that I did it so I'm also here to tell you if you have a dream as well that you are seeking out and taking the bar in the US is a necessary part of realizing that you can get there this chair is what I ordered for myself when I found out that I had passed the bar and I decided that I would sit in this chair and share exciting things that motivate me share my journey in getting here and do a lot of great legal work in the chair as well so I often work remotely so here I am sitting in my chair. I made it and you can too. So let me tell you a little bit about the different classifications. That won't tell you everything that you need to know about eligibility because I can only speak from a Washington perspective, Washington state perspective, but many other states are also open to foreign qualified attorneys. The most well-known one is New York state. I have quite a few friends who've taken the New York bar because I went to law school in England. It's actually a relatively common thing to see London attorneys, solicitors usually, rather than barristers who have a dual qualification between England and the US, usually the New York bar, because you're eligible with that common law LLB to take the New York bar since it's a three year substantially similar law degree as they think about it. I will link the information for that down below. So New York State is considered to be the easiest state because you don't actually need practice experience, to my knowledge that has not changed, um, to be able to be eligible to sit that bar. Also aware that Texas is open to foreign qualified lawyers and of course Washington State as well. And you'll need to do your own research, but to my knowledge, other states that are open to foreign qualified attorneys may or may not need an LLM from an ABA approved law school to take the bar in these states. I know that you don't need it for New York and for Washington state. For California, you need practice experience or an LLM, I believe, but other states that are options for you are Texas, the District of Columbia, Illinois, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and where I took the bar, Washington State. Just opening up my laptop to be able to tell you a little bit about why I think foreign qualified attorneys specifically can benefit from this video series and why I was quite daunted by the process. So even though I had two law degrees under my belt, I did not have a US LLM. I had a Canadian LLM from the University of Toronto. And like I said, a law degree, a qualifying law degree for Canada um, as a result of the NCA conversion process. I have another video on that, which I will link down below. So you can essentially in Canada, take your law degree abroad, come back, take some, um, conversion exams, some Canadian law exams, and then have to, that degree recognized as substantially equivalent. So my degree was um, from the United Kingdom, from Durham University, which is a very good school over there. I'm a dual citizen of both the US and Canada. I know, 
so much information, but it's important to this. Um, and so as a result of that, I had an international education, if you like, and a Canadian education. I was called to the bar in British Columbia in 2013 for knocking on the door of the Washington bar, if I can put it that way. And they have essentially five different buckets that you can fit yourself into. And like I said, it is similar in many other US states. There are those opportunities available to foreign qualified attorneys. Here's a summer 2021 bar exam statistics of which I am part. I'm part of the passing statistic for that. If you're curious about my score, I got a 306. Because of the pandemic, the score was lowered to, I believe, a 266 for the year that I took the bar. So like I said, there's five different sort of pipes that applicants can come in through. The first is the most obvious ABA approved law school JDs who have graduated and so they numbered um, 559 and they had an 80% pass rate for the July bar exam, which is high. Then there's also what's called APR6 law clerk candidates. I didn't know what this was the first time I saw this. It's essentially someone who apprentices for another attorney and doesn't have a law degree. So there aren't usually that many of those. And if that sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you've seen something about Kim Kardashian using the California version of that exemption as part of her journey to try and take the bar. She hasn't actually taken the full bar yet, but that is the kind of exemption in California um, that she's been using. So Washington is one of the states that has that um, as well. Next one is U.S. attorneys. So what that means is it's someone from another state who um, has not gotten reciprocity. So perhaps they took the bar before it was a UBE system. Um, a lot of the states joined at different points in time. Um, so if they're a U.S. attorney from another state, they might even have years of practice under their belt. They still might take, need to take the Washington bar if they want to become Washington attorneys, if they haven't taken the UBE, or I believe if they haven't taken it sufficiently recently. Next after that is me, so common law attorney, and I can see that the total number of my peers for the July 2021 sitting was a total of six of us. There are a total of two of us who passed, so I'm one of the two, which is kind of crazy. I wonder who the other person was. And there are a total of four fails. That means that the pass rate for my peer group of common law attorneys, so attorneys from foreign jurisdictions who had practice under their belt, our pass rate was 33.3%. That's the overall pass rate. For the first timers, of which I am also one, there were apparently five of us um, who were first timers, two of us who passed again, of course, three who failed, so that's 40%. So even looking at the first timer statistic, 40% versus 80% or 83% for ABA approved law school graduates taking it for the first time, it was 83.7, so sorry, 84%. That is a huge world of a difference. There are many reasons that foreign attorneys, even attorneys who have significant practice experience, find the bar very difficult and for whom it is a significant life hurdle to get past to make it to this point. So that's why I'm sharing this information with you in this series. And then last category or bucket, if you like, of people coming in are ABA LLMs, or apparently they also add non-ABA JDs into that category as well. There were 53 of those people for the overall pass rate. 43 of them failed, 10 passed, that's a 19% pass rate, which is incredibly low compared to the pass rates for every state. So now that we have those scary statistics out of the way, but then what does it look like in practice? And so this is where I want to save you what I went through, where every single step took me quite a lot of hours of research and I had to put together piecemeal information on every step that wasn't from the same source. So I'm kind of compiling everything for you, but you're gonna have to do your own research about every step ultimately. I think it's just nice to have a point of reference that sets out the whole thing from start to finish in case you may be in a similar situation to me. So the application process, of course, involves a lot of paperwork, 
notarized documents, lots of ID. Um, the first step that I took because it was the one that I was worried would take the longest, um, but it actually was quite prompt. I had to obtain a certificate of good standing for me from the Law Society of British Columbia. Keep in mind when we look at the wording of the rule, it does refer to the common law of England, but the common law of England is also what people practice under in Australia and so many countries around the world that are part of the commonwealth. I'm sure there's further guidance um, out there on where the limits are for that, but essentially for um, a quick reminder, there's civil law systems and common law systems and common law systems are what tends to still be dominant throughout all the different parts of the Commonwealth. So England is where I happen to study. The common law of England is the basis of jurisprudence in many other places throughout the world. Canada is another one. Where I came from, I got my certificate of good standing from the Law Society of BC. Um, I had a whole bunch of documents notarized, which was really difficult at the time to find someone who would do that. Um, and then I sent everything off to the Washington Bar. What comes after that is a long process. So in order to verify your references and everything that goes into the good moral character aspect of it, including, you know, criminal background checks, the works, all that goes through the NCBE now. Um, so they kind of run their own process and you deal with them um, as to any, you know, copies of your diplomas and so forth. And that can take many months. So that is why this process, this journey that I've been on for most people, who are not ABA law school graduates is going to take several years. Start to finish, so from when you decide to apply to when you potentially have your bar card in your hands like I did at the beginning, you know, I'm making a big deal about it, not because I want to gloat, but because not just about motivation and finances, it's also about timeline. You have to give yourself enough time to do all of this and presumably, you know, have some means of supporting yourself in between as you go through this journey. And I think it's important to set that out from the beginning, right? That it's not something that happens overnight where you like sign up for Barbary and then you're studying and spending all your hundreds of hours studying and it's that study that gets you to that end game point. It's actually that the studying um, for most people comes later. Um, and so you have to be ready for the whole process, for the whole experience. As well, what I find um, is often unrepresented or not represented at all um, in sort of guides that you see that are put out by Kaplan, by Barbary, etc. They just talk about the UBE because that's what they do is they prepare you for that exam, which is multi-part. So the UBE, whenever people refer to that, actually consists of three parts. It's a three-pronged thing. It's the uniform bar exam that most states have adopted and it comprises of the MBE, which is the multiple choice section, the MEE, which is the essay section, and the MPT for states that have it, which is the long essay question. It's kind of like a long analysis that you do under time significant time pressure um, and it's much longer the, than the MEE essays are, but you also don't apply anything um, substantial, so they give you everything that you need to know. It's a test of your legal analysis skills. More on that in the second video for sure, but this is, you know, an important part of the process. So everyone always talks about the UBE, but that's not all there is to it, right? So you only get to sit the bar if the NCBE completes their process, you are approved under whatever bucket that you've decided to apply under. The LLM one would be another example, or the Foreign Qualified Attorneys one, which is the one that I did. Um, so they give you the green light. That means you are approved to sit the bar exam but there's actually still more required of you than just the UBE, although the UBE will be your focus for sure. Um, I know Barbary recommends 10 months of studying. Many people do do it in less than that, but some people also take more time. Honestly, it depends what your life is like. It depends how many other pressures you have um, and how much time you're going to spend on it, as well as your familiarity with US law. I would say that I had a decent familiarity with US law by virtue of my work in securities regulation.
foundation I had pretty good familiarity from that and I also had a very basic familiarity as well of US constitutional law US criminal law and US legal ethics um, from a course that I took in England at Oxford University which was in partnership with the Mord School of Law. So that kind of gave me a little bit of a basis to jump from, but let me tell you otherwise, I did not know really anything about um, civil procedure over here, very different, didn't know anything about that other than a few things related to like summary judgment and things like that that are similar in Canada. But the specificity of how they test you for the bar exam is so great that most foreign attorneys will have to learn a very significant amount of material in order to pass the bar exam. So you have to be prepared for that and it's doable and my next two videos are going to help you with that because I really, really wanna share the lessons um, that I learned, but I feel like the lessons don't make sense if you don't know about the process. So back to the process, that's the UBE. You are gonna spend most of your time preparing for that, but something that I did not know on day one was that it wasn't just the UBE once you get that green light from the state bar, once you've been green lighted as a human to sit the bar exam, it's not just about the UBE. There's also usually a state bar component. So for Washington, that's the Washington law component. It's not difficult, but it's going to be another thing to fit into your timeline of when you will get your bar card. And so that's something else that you'll need to do but you can take that at home and I think that will be continuous so um, although the bar exam was administered remotely when I sat for it um, and that was a significant source of problems for many people um, who experienced a lot of technology issues throughout the US um, I know for this July sitting it was a significant issue um, and it was even an issue for me although less so for me than for others um, but the Washington law component has always been remote or it's been remote for a long time. So that's going to continuously be available on a remote basis. Also for that one, you can take that one when you want, but you have to pass the bar exam first. So you can't take it before you pass the bar exam. You have to first get that passing score. So I got mine in early September. That means I was green lighted to th then take the Washington law component as well. So you get your green light from the NCBE and the WSBA. You sit the UBE, you get your passing score in September if you are taking the July bar exam, or I believe in April if you are taking the February sitting, there's only two. You take the Washington law component but there's one more thing as well, and this is the one that I feel like very few people mention, that's called the MPRE. The MPRE is a legal ethics test. It's not very difficult if you've engaged with legal ethics before as I had. It won't be new information, but like with everything else, there are hairline rules that you need to memorize in order to be able to get a good score on the exam. You need an 85 to pass for most states. That exam, even when most of the state bar exams were administered remotely, was administered in person. Whole separate thing that they do, so you need to apply for that separately as well. So you do that application and there are only three sittings for the MPRE. So it's an important step for you to take at some point during your journey and most people who are JD law students will already have done it. So that's why nobody really mentions it but you need to figure out in your grand timeline that you're setting up for yourself when you will be taking that. And I feel like that's something that's seldom mentioned, but it's a very important step, both in terms of content and in terms of actually being able to then have your application submitted before the courts in the state that you are applying to, and then have that final approval, which is what results in the bar card that I just showed you. The green light to sit the bar exam, the passing score for the bar exam, and the final bar card are all actually separate distinct steps. So that's an introduction to my journey and the first taster of information that I have to share with you. Thank you so much for watching this video and for being a part of my journey over these last 10 years of YouTube. Take care and I will see you in my next installment. Bye!